So today we're going to start a new series, as Mike was talking about a little bit earlier, on the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit just means, as he was saying, it should be fruit that is, comes out of our life because of the Holy Spirit, right? It should be the way that we look. It should be what we're known for because we believe in Jesus Christ. So these should be markers, hence the title of the sermon series, The Person, Becoming the Person God Wants You to Be. Now we're going to start with this first one and just kind of, you know, at surface level, it seems like this should be a pretty easy one for us to grasp. We're talking about love. Everybody has an idea of love, knows what love is. We, we all get the concept behind it, but it, it's, it's arguably one of the more difficult things to do in our world today because of all the craziness that's going on. So I want to take a look at this a little bit because in 1 John 4, 7, 8, Jesus just shares, or John shares these words. He says, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So the natural question really is, what is love? You hear that's what the church is all about. You know, it's about love and that God is just about love. And, and we keep hearing that word over and over and over. But what does love actually mean? There's a few misconceptions that are out there today. And one of them is, I only have to love people that agree with me. Isn't that kind of a funny thing? And it seems so dumb that I would even say it that way, but that's actually the way we work. In fact, you know, in the first service, we actually read a verse. He goes, you know, what credit to you if you love those that love you? I mean, even sinners do that, but that's kind of the world around us. We love you as long as you agree with me. We love you as long as you know you don't come cause problems with me. You love you as long as you're being obedient. You love me as it's conditional love. As long as you do what I say, as long as you agree with the way I think, I will care for you, I will love you. But the second that you disagree, I give myself permission to cut off the relationship, to hate you, to say horrible things. And you see this in politics, and you see this in the church, and you see this at work, and you see this in your family, and you just see it everywhere. But that's not love. Love is, and I'm going to give you this phrase, I love you anyway. I love you even though you hurt me. I I love you even though you are not doing at all what I asked you to do. I love you even though you're destroying your life right now and you won't let me help. I love you anyway. I love you even though we disagree. I love you. And I want you to think of that in terms of your spouse, in terms of your kids, in terms of your friends. I love you anyway. And I think it's a remarkable thing because I've seen people throw away 20-year friendships because one of them looked at the other one weird. Looked at them weird. We can't even give permission for one of our friends to have an off day or to say an off thing without just blowing up the whole relationship. Have we got that sensitive? And before you disagree with me at all, think about COVID when some of your family wanted to wear the mask and some of them didn't. I know family members that walked away from each other over a stupid piece of cloth. It's an interesting world that we live in, and yet God calls us in the midst of this world to love them anyway, despite their sin, despite their opinions, despite the way they look at the world. It doesn't mean approval. God sent Jesus down to this world because we're sinners and needed a Savior. He loved us enough to come and save us. It wasn't because he approved of everything that we were doing. He loved us anyway. The word love is an interesting word because it's used for so many different things. I love my wife. I love America. I love tacos. I love hot dogs. I love my, uh, the flag. I love the Detroit Lions, right? I love all those different things. And so you start looking at this and we're forced to ask again, what does it mean? And ask that because again, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Here's another one. Some people think that love is a feeling, right? And that's the romantic love. We hear it in all the songs that we sing. We hear it, you know, we see it in all the movies, but, but it's not actually true, Scripture tells us the opposite. Psychologists will tell you the opposite. Philosophy from the beginning of time till now will tell you the opposite. Studies done over the last hundred years on this subject will tell you the opposite. And they all come to the same conclusion that love is not a feeling. And yet we always kind of think of it as an ocean of emotion, as goosebumps on my goosebumps, right? A quiver in my liver. You know, I got to have this feeling and I'm just a victim to this emotion that I can't handle, Now, it's true that love does cause feelings, but love is in itself not a feeling. Again, let me say that love produces tremendous feelings, and that's a good thing, right? That's, we want that, but but the reality is that love is, again, not a feeling. It's actually much more than that. Scripture will actually go on to tell us that love is two things. First of all, love is a matter of choice. Colossians 3.14 says, and over all these put on love, which binds them together, which means you put it on like a coat. It's something that you choose to do. Love is a commitment 
to care for somebody that's controllable. I made a commitment to my wife, and I keep committing to care for her as long as we're married and life continues to go on. There's times that my wife and I are in the same room and we're arguing, and we do not like each other very much at that moment, but we love each other. It's a commitment to love each other past the disagreements. It's a commitment to, to love each other past the, the things that we do to hurt each other. It's a commitment to keep on loving, and it's controllable, and it's something we continue to choose to do every day. It's something you put on like a coat. It's the way that you love your kids. It's the way that you love your friends, all those different things. It's controllable who you will love and who you will choose not to love. But also love is a matter of conduct. It's an action. It's something that you do. It's more than just feelings. It's more than just words. In 1 John 3.18, it says, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. In other words, love is something that we do. You see that in 1 Corinthians 13, right? It gives a whole list of things of what love is, and all of them are action verbs. It's a behavior. It's not just talk. It's like the fiancé that says to his, his fiancé, fiance, he says, I die for you, my love. She says, I don't know. You keep saying it, but you don't do it, you know? See, love is something that you do. It's an action. It's an effort. It's more than just words or talk. So today I want to take a look at something I think is hard. I want to take a look at how do you love the unlovely? How do you love the people that disagree with you? How do you love the people that have hurt you? And let's just be honest. In a room this size, there's there's some people that have been hurt a lot in some really damaging ways. How do you learn to get rid of that resentment? How do you learn to love people that that you're just frustrated or that you don't like very much in the moment. And I say that because our lives are filled with people that we don't like. We don't like the way people act. We don't like the way people dress, the way they talk, the way they smell. The truth is, we just don't like some people. And most of all, we don't like people who don't like us. I think that's why politics are so vicious, right? Because both sides have been unapologetic in the fact that they don't like the other side. And so they don't even try to work it together, right? They're just yelling at each other all the time. Winston Churchill and Lady Astor had this famous rivalry that was going on, and one day Lady Astor said, if I were your wife, I'd put arsenic in your beer. And Churchill said, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. (laughs) (laughs) So let's just face it, you have people you don't like, I have people I don't like, but the Bible says God wants us to learn to love even the unlovely. It's a crazy world where if you disagree with me, all of a sudden we can't be friends. Where if you disagree with me, all of a sudden I can say the most horrible things about you and give myself permission to do those things. It's crazy and it doesn't make sense, but that's the world that we got right now. It's it's one of the reasons that God, or Jesus talks about this the way it does. It's one of the reasons that love is to be known as one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the reasons that Christians are to be known by their love, not by our hate, not by our ridicule, not by our slander, but by our love for one another. So how do you do this? I'm going to give you five things that Scripture talks about. We'll call them steps, but they're just five things that God calls us to do to get ourselves and our hearts in that position where we can love people that are frustrating us at the moment. So let's start with the first one. One of the first things is we need to experience God's love for ourselves. And I know you're hearing that and you're thinking, Pastor, I'm already in church. I already know God's love. I already get it. That's why I'm here today. So let me explain. Because I think to begin this discussion, we probably need to understand that we ourselves are part of that unlovely crowd, that we're sinful. And I know you're confused right now because I keep telling you how amazing you are in this service, right? You're like, you're the most perfect in all this congregation. But the reality is that we're part of that unlovely, that sinful group, even you guys. Because we know that God hates sin, and yet what do we do? We still do it. So let's add to those first two, that unlovely and that sinful part. Let's add the fact that we're a little bit arrogant, that we keep on doing things that we know God hates. Also, we know how God grieves over the hurt that we've caused ourselves and other people and him and all the way throughout our lives. Let's just be honest, probably even earlier today. So maybe we need to add a little bit of the the next word is rebellious that we keep on doing it even though we know it causes pain, that we keep on doing it even though we know it causes hurt, that we hear God's command, but we keep on doing just the opposite. And somehow, even though we know the sin, we continue to rebel and deny and betray and hurt him by the continual sin in our lives, that we are the unlovely. But one of the cool things we learn at Easter, right, is that we have a God who, in spite of knowing exactly who we are, 
That's the thing I love about God. He doesn't pretend that what we're doing is right. He doesn't change the way he's viewing stuff and pretend it's right. He doesn't pretend he doesn't know what's going on. He knows exactly what's going on. He comes in with eyes wide open. He knows exactly what you did, exactly what you said, exactly where you've been, exactly what you're struggling with, exactly what your fears are. And he came and he pursued you and he loves you. It's why he sent us Jesus. And now because of that Jesus, because of what he did for us by dying on the cross and by rising again, he is now confirmed for all time and all eternity this amazing forgiveness and grace and love as a gift for anybody who would believe in him. See, he came knowing that we were broken, knowing that we were messed up, knowing that we needed somebody to help make sense of our life, knowing that we needed a savior, knowing that we needed to be forgiven, knowing that we needed a second chance. And he came and he pursued us and he died on the cross so that we could have all that. So this process begins of loving somebody else who doesn't really deserve it. The process begins with understanding first that that's exactly what Jesus did for us. That he came for a bunch of people who clearly didn't and still don't today deserve any of it. Why did he do this? Because he loves you guys. Because he created you to spend eternity with him. Because he saw you were going the wrong way. Because he saw that you weren't going to make it without him. And so he sent Jesus so that you could be forgiven, reconciled, and spend your eternity with him forever in heaven. Truth is, this is the beginning point for learning to love the unlovely. To begin to understand that this is the kind of love that Jesus has for you, that has pursued you with. In Ephesians 3, 17 and 18, Paul prays for this very thing. He says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart, living within you as you trust him. May your roots go deep into the soil of God's marvelous love, and may you be able to feel and understand how long and wide and deep and high his love for you really is and experience his love for yourself. In other words, he wants you more than just to know it, right? He wants you to experience it, to feel it. Have any of you been blown away at a time in your life where God just said those words, you're forgiven? I mean, just think of, you just did the most horrific thing. Maybe you guys, but you can remember, right? I mean, I mean, me too. <laughs> Stuff that you've done is so horrible, and you're embarrassed, and you're sure that God's just gonna hammer you, and God says, I forgive you. And it gives you that fresh start, and it gives you the strength to keep on going. And all of a sudden, you're experiencing it in a different way. Or all of a sudden, you realize that you still matter because God's word speaks to you in that moment saying, I still care about you, even in the midst of this mess. He wants you to feel it, right? To experience it in your heart. That's why he came. That's why he died the way he did, so that you could experience firsthand how long and wide and deep and high his love for you really is. But then he goes beyond that. And he says, okay, this is the hard part. He goes, I need you to learn to forgive those people that have hurt you. You gotta let go for your sake, for their sake. To put this in context, I want you to think of, I don't know, the worst thing somebody's done to you. And then I want you to think of Lent and as we went through that whole process before Easter and all the stuff that Jesus went to, went through on the way to the cross, right? And I want you to think of the fact that they were, just had beaten him up into a pulp. They had crammed that thorn on his head that they had put, pierced or uh, strung him up on the cross and all those different things. They're still mocking them. He's still ridiculing them. And Jesus says these words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Can you hear that in the midst of that? I'm going to get that phone pretty set. Pretty set. There you go. Um, but can you hear that in the midst of that? Right? They're in the midst of hurting him. They're in the midst of mocking him. They're in the midst of ridiculing him. He's suffering in pain on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Can you show the same kind of grace to others? I mean, as you read through Scripture, they clearly knew what they were doing, except they didn't know really what they were doing, that they were doing it to the Son of God. So often in life, people say things, they do things that are just horrible. Can you give them the grace of saying, Father, I forgive them even in the midst of all the stuff that's going on? 1 Corinthians 3.13, Paul gives us this encouragement. It says, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Why is this so important? Because it's impossible, God says, for you to love one person and hate somebody else at the same time. You can't say, I love the Lord and hate somebody else at the same time, it says in Scripture. In other words, I can't fully love my kids if at the same time I'm still resenting my parents. And I cannot fully love my spouse if at the same time I'm resenting my my former girlfriend, right? 
I cannot love somebody and be resentful of somebody at the same time. Why? Because Scripture says, a bitter heart is a divided heart. I want you to look around in our culture, at a culture that says, just love. God is just love. Just love people. And they love you as long as you agree with them or go along with them. But what happens when you don't? In an instant, they give themselves permission, right or left, to spew all this hatred at you. It's conditional love. It's a divided heart. It's not true love. Somebody says, why can't I love my husband? And the answer is because you're still holding on to the past. Why can't I love my wife? Because you're still reacting to the past. In other words, Jesus is saying we've got to let it go because, again, a divided heart is a resentful heart. You can't love somebody fully if you're still holding on, if you're still reacting to somebody in the past. Jesus, as he was dying, shows us an example of what it is to let it all go. As he's dying on the cross, right, he says, Father, forgive them so that he could fully love us. Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. The value of forgiveness is, first of all, is it frees our heart, doesn't it? We don't have to cycle through that pain anymore. We don't have to cycle through that hurt anymore. One of the gifts of forgiveness is all about us. It just frees us from that past. But it's also the key to reconciling relationships that we say matter to us. It's forgiving that offhand comment. It's forgiving that lie. It's forgiving that hurt. It's forgiving that pain and trying to reconcile that relationship that was once valuable. Here's another thing you do. You think loving thoughts. Philippians 2 verses 4 and 5, it says, don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they're doing. Your attitude should be the same kind that was shown to us by Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about that. How in the world do you have loving thoughts toward an unloving person? And the answer is by focusing on their hurts and their problems and their needs. You say, well, what are their hurts and their problems and their needs? And ask them. Ask them what's going on. This is where you get your eyes off yourself and on the other person, where you actually ask yourself, where are they hurting? Because the more you understand them, the more you'll get a context for why they're behaving and acting the way that they are. Because when somebody's hurting you, right, it's because they're hurting inside. And it becomes much easier for you to love them when you can look beyond your hurt and see the hurt that's going inside them. It helps you move from resentment to pity. It helps you be more sympathetic Jesus says, come unto me, all you are weary and in need of rest, and I'll give you peace. I shared this story uh, Wednesday night at the men's group, but I'll share it again. And some of you guys have already heard this, but it has application. So I was a young pastor, right? And it, we were in Texas, and it was uh, one of the pastor's conferences. And one of the things we did at pastor conferences is we have these table discussions. And the kind of the prompt for the day was, how do you forgive the unforgivable? How do you love the unlovable? I mean, the district president just happened to be at the table of all of us young guys, and so we were all intimidated. None of us wanted to go first. And so he kind of broke the ice, and he went first for us, and he said this. He says, a year ago, my daughter was raped, and I hated that kid. I hated him with everything that was in me. I, I wanted hurt to come to him. I wanted pain to come to him. You just don't understand what it does to you when something like that happens to your young kid. It's, it's just wrong. I hated him for the hurt that he caused my daughter. I hated him for the reparable harm that he had did to her, both psychological and physical. I just hated him. He goes, I know I'm the district president and pastor, right? I, get, I was doing the wrong thing. But it was consuming me, and I was getting swallowed up by it. One of my buddies said, he, he said, I got to start praying for him, and the feelings will come. <laughs> it seemed like such a hollow thing to say, but I knew he was right. It, so he said, I began praying. I began praying that God would get a hold of him, that God would become real to him, that God would kind of turn him around and, and save him and heal his heart. I mean, I knew the kid had been through some hard things growing up. There's a lot of pain in his life that God would heal that stuff. And he goes, to be honest, it was just words at the beginning. I mean, that's all I could do was just to get out those words and pray some kind of blessing on this kid. And I continued for a long time until one day, I don't know, about six months in, all of a sudden I realized they weren't words anymore. I was actually really grieved about kind of the growing up of this kid and how much pain and abuse that he had to endure. I, I was grieved over his present situation and all the, the obstacles and hardships that he had and didn't excuse anything that he did, but man, I just, 
My heart started going out to him. And so as I was praying, I was praying that he would heal his heart, right? That he would turn him around. That, and it wasn't now to punish him. It was just to save him, to show him Jesus, to give him a different life. It was just to help him. And all of a sudden, as I, I realized I was doing that, I realized my heart was free. It wasn't in bondage anymore to what happened. It was, it was free just to care about this kid as he was. That's where I realized I moved from resentment to pity. That's where I realized I could finally just love this kid for who he was. Thing is, you, you don't get there unless you change the way you're thinking, unless you change your understanding of what's going on. We can have a big congregational conversation about changing the name or whatever, right? And, but sometimes we don't understand where other people are coming from. We don't understand maybe the fear that's behind some of the decisions or the experience in the past that maybe led them to, to be a little wary or, or, or the, the kids that they want to save, be saved. Maybe their own because maybe they will be more open. We don't get the why so often. We just get the end result. And we stop caring and we stop seeing the other person. And God says, you got to move past that. Because those that deserve your love the most, man, are those that need, are the, the least, are those that deserve it the least are those that often need it the most. They need massive doses of your love to heal their emotions and to restore those relationships. And because of that, one of my prayers for this church is that this would be a place where people receive massive doses of love, especially when they're hurting. And I share that because I think most of the time we're way more interested in being loved than actually giving love. But the way we work is our thoughts determine the way we feel, and the way we feel determines the way we act. And so if we're being unloving, it's because we're feeling unloving. And if we're feeling unloving, it's because we're thinking unloving thoughts. The truth is, you just can't force a feeling. I wish you could. And so you have to start with the way you think. You have to change the way you think, and it will automatically change the way that you feel. But you can't force feelings. It doesn't ever work. You have to see it from their perspective. You have to know what's going on. And it helps you become sympathetic to their needs. And if you do that, Jesus says, the feelings, I promise you, will come. And you'll begin to change. Then he goes on and gives us another hard thing. And he says, I must begin acting in loving ways, even when they're a jerk, right? Even when we don't want to. For God so loved our sinful world that he gave his one and only son to die for it. And it's an amazing love to me, right? That God would have sent Jesus for people who clearly didn't love him or care about what he was doing. Likewise, Jesus says to us, even though I don't feel it, I'm supposed to act in a loving way, that that's modeling Christ in me. Someone asked me, isn't that being hypocritical, right? To be loving towards somebody I'm not loving toward. And I said, no. It's not hypocritical at all. Rather, it's loving in advance. It's loving through faith. And loving by faith is one of the most powerful entities in this whole world. It's what Jesus did for us. So the most important thing I'll say to you today is it's easier to act my way into a feeling than to feel my way into an action. Because even though I didn't feel like it, I act loving and the feelings come. Some husband says, when I feel considerate toward my wife, I'll start acting considerate toward my wife. When's he going to feel it? Never. The wife says, when I feel romantic toward my husband, I'll start acting romantic toward my husband. Truth is, it's probably not going to happen, ladies. You act your way into a feeling. You don't feel your way. Some of you are, are waiting for feelings to come that are not coming, especially in romance, and they're just not coming back. But you have to act your way into those feelings, and you can't wait for somebody else to do the action. You've got to start first because those feelings, they just don't pop up. You cannot change your feelings by force or by want to. You have to change it by changing the way that you're thinking. And that will change your actions, which will eventually change your feelings. In other words, you begin by loving in a loving way and the feelings will come. There's a saying that I don't like very much, but it but that has a lot of truth when it comes to following God. Fake it till you feel it. You do what's right knowing that it's right, knowing that God gave it to you, knowing that it's the best way forward, knowing that it's his path, knowing that it leads probably to blessing and not to complication, knowing all these things, you, you trust that his way's right and you trust that the feelings will come. And finally, you expect the best from them. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, if you love someone, you will always believe in him and always expect the best of him. Is that hard when they've hurt you? Yeah. Is that hard when they disagree with you? Yeah. But the truth is we tend to live up to what other people expect of us. 
Dads, when you tell your kids that they're stupid, does that make them smarter? No. In fact, every study ever done on this said that it has just the opposite effect. Ladies, if you say to your husband, you're really lazy, aren't you? Do you think that gives them all sorts of motivation and initiative to change? No. Labeling only reinforces the negative. It never changes anybody. Nagging doesn't work, so you have to learn to speak positively to people. You have to start kind of setting the bar of what they can be, of what they can become, of what you believe them to be. Jesus says, follow me. I know you can do it. Do we stink at following him? Yes. But he says, I believe you guys can do this. I will give you the strength. Just keep trusting me. I've got you. You always treat them the way you want them to become. You expect the best of them. That's what Jesus does for us. He says, come and follow me. So you raise that level of expectation and you watch people blossom under that affirmation and that expectation. You treat them the way that you want them to become. In the end, we are the unlovable. And Jesus is our model for what true love is. And it's an amazing love. My friend, Jesus has indeed been risen from the dead and because of that, our sins are no more. He is indeed sitting at the right hand of God, and because of that, he's been given all the power to judge, and more than that, he says to you this day, I love you. I've forgiven you for everything. I've got you as you're going through this life. Keep trusting me. Keep trusting me until we can spend our eternity together in heaven. That's what love is. That's what love looks like. And love is a lot harder than our world makes it out to seem. But when we do it right, it changes people's lives. And that's my encouragement today, so let me pray. God, we love you so much. And you know, as you walk us through this what love is thing, it's hard. I mean, it's easy to love people that always agree with us. It's easy to love people that love us back. It's, it's easy even to be patient in the midst of difficulties or disagreements when we know they love us back. But Man, all that hurt, Lord, that we've experienced in our life and all that, that pain and, and all the ways we get geared up in our world of politics and feelings and emotions today. And Father, help us love people that we find unlovely. For Republicans, help us love Democrats. And for Democrats, help us love Republicans. It's, if we're in a family and we're struggling with some of our siblings or parents, help us forgive the past so that we can start that reconciliation process. If we've lost friends over stupid things, help us reach out and say the words we're sorry. Father, give us that ability to reclaim relationships, to heal relationships, and most of all, to heal our own selves so that we can be freed again just to love on people. Father, that's our prayer today. We pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. amen.